Now, when we arranged this program, the program for the year, we gave a choice to our speakers to choose whom they would to speak on. We didn't issue out who there was to speak on. We gave some suggestions which could be taken or needn't be taken. But uh, we left it to the speakers to choose the subjects of those persons in history who were foreshadowings of the Antichrist. We are specifically told in the Bible that there is an Antichrist to arise and we are told quite a lot of things about him. Uh, and as mentioned when Mr. Foster was here last month, he said that all these, all these people in history do give us some idea of what the Antichrist will be like, but none of them really fulfill everything. And we have to wait to see what the final Antichrist will be like. Well, what I was going to say was this. Mr. Green chose Herod. That was for originally for April, of course, but um, he was unable to come then. He chose Herod. And then Mrs. Green says to me this morning when she telephoned, Mr. Green won't be able to come. So I immediately think in my mind, well, I shall have to take the subject. When I started to think about it, I, I thought to myself, I wonder which Herod Mr. Green had in mind when he, when he chose the subject, because there's more than one Herod in the Bible, of course. There are more than one Herod anyway, but there are certainly more than one in the Bible. And uh, so I thought to myself, what one should I take? But as I thought about it, I thought, well, it would be a good idea to go through the different Herods, some of the Herods anyway, that are there, we know that are there, and see what it has to say about them. So that's what I thought we would do tonight, as the Lord shall help us. I feel in a way that I haven't been able to do the preparation I would like to have done but for, that, for such a subject. But on the other hand, we trust that the Lord will help us and that what is brought out from the Scriptures will be a help and blessing to us all. So I thought that firstly we could think of Herod and the Incarnation and that's the story that we read earlier in the meeting, from Matthew chapter 2 in particular. And then secondly, the Herod who a little later was there in the time of John the Baptist, so it's Herod and John the Baptist. And then thirdly, as we think of the record in the Acts of the Apostles, thinking of Herod, Herod and the Apostles. So there are the three little thoughts, the three little, the three Herods really, Herod and the Incarnation, Herod and John the Baptist, and Herod and the Apostles. If you will turn to, to um, Matthew chapter 2, you will see that Herod was king in Judea, <coughs> under the Roman Empire, of course, but he was king in Judea at the time that the Lord Jesus Christ was born. And in this chapter, the second chapter in Matthew, we read that it was wise men from the east that came to Jerusalem. They wouldn't have been Jews, they would have been Gentiles. They came to Jerusalem and they came with this question, where is he that is born king of the Jews? They didn't have the question, is there a king of the Jews born? But they said, where is he born? They seemed absolutely certain that the king of the Jews was born. And they gave the reason for their coming. They said in this verse 2, we are come to worship him. There was a purpose in their coming. They wanted to worship. And they explained that. It wasn't just a question of, of uh, curiosity. They came, they said, to worship him who was born. This to me is all very interesting. That the wise men, as they're called, translated here in the authorised version, as they're called here, came and, and asked this question in Jerusalem. But before all this happened, there had been a wonderful thing that had occurred. Shepherds were in the fields of Bethlehem, 
an angel came and spoke, well, angels came and declared, it was declared to these shepherds that the Saviour was born. The wording was, unto you is born this day in the city of Bethlehem a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. And the shepherds went to the manger where the Lord Jesus Christ in the in the um, part of that, the inn where he was, if you can call it part of the inn, they went to worship him. But nobody in Jerusalem seems to have concerned themselves about it. They didn't seem to stir at all. But when the wise men came a little later on, that soon caused a stir. Because we read in the next verses, verses 3 and 4, when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled. And it also says, so was Jerusalem. All Jerusalem was troubled with him. They didn't seem disturbed about the wonderful sign from heaven. And yet here they were, concerned when these wise men came. They were troubled about one being born as the king of the Jews and one who was to receive worship. I think this gives us, first of all, a little insight into Herod. You know, he was by now a reasonably old man and I suppose it would be true to say that he couldn't expected, have expected to still be on the throne when this child, this babe that was only just born, grew old enough to be the king. And yet it troubles him, it troubles him that there is a king born. And we go on in the story, don't we? Herod seems to know something about these things and he, he, he asks the chief priests and the scribes, these men who ought to know. The Bible tells us that people had to go to the priests to acquire knowledge and the scribes, of course, were the writers who kept accounts of things. So Herod went to him, so concerned, so troubled was he about this message from the, these wise men that he goes to these others and says to them, where is the Messiah to be born? Where is this king of the Jews? These wise men from the East are talking about, where is he to be born? And they tell him what the Bible says. It says in the Old Testament scriptures, and we know, of course, it's in Micah chapter 5. If you have a margin Bible, you'll see Micah 5 verse 2 there that it's in Bethlehem. They didn't give an exact quote, but they knew it was in Bethlehem. And they knew it was in Bethlehem in the land of Judah. They're very specific, and God was very specific, because as you know, this wasn't the only Bethlehem in the land of Israel. We are told in Joshua there was another Bethlehem up in uh, Zebulun, but it was the Bethlehem that was in the land of Judah. And that's where the one was to be born who was ultimately to be ruler of the people of Israel. Now, these men, the priests and the scribes, would have had the Old Testament scriptures, and they would have known, they must have known, from the book of Daniel, that it was going to be about this time. And there you are, they also knew from the book of Micah that the birth was to be at Bethlehem. But it's rather surprising, isn't it, that not only Herod, but the people of Jerusalem didn't seem to show any interest in this. But is it surprising? You know, we're told of lots of things that will happen before the Lord comes again. But I find that generally speaking, lots of Christians aren't interested in this. They're just not interested in what God says about these things. And you try and talk to them and they, they think you're a crank. 
They think you're an eccentric. We find this, don't we? I certainly find it. People aren't interested, and they weren't interested. Of course, there were a few. We could say the shepherds, the shepherds. They took enough interest to go to Bethlehem and, and find out about it. And, of course, we read in the Bible there was a man called Simeon. And, and he was thinking of what the Old Testament prophecy said. And he was realising that the Lord Jesus Christ would soon come into the world. And he was anxious to, to see the the Messiah, when he was born. Simeon took an interest. And we're also told of Anna. Anna took an interest. Anna was there in Jerusalem and she was speaking to people about redemption. She took an interest in these things. Well, there you are, generally speaking, the people of Jerusalem weren't interested and Herod himself didn't show any interest until he was faced with the question that these wise men brought, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And as I said, it shows something of Herod's character in as much as he did not like the idea of one being born to be king. He didn't want to be displaced. And not, I suppose, I don't know how he thought, whether he thought it through anyway. But perhaps he thought he didn't want his offspring to be displaced. And he, he was troubled. That's what it says. He was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. So he called the wise men. And he inquired them about the star. Now he didn't think to himself, did he, that... Here's a star appearing in the heavens. God has put it there. This is a message from God. And that he ought to submit to what God was revealing. His concern seems to have been that he would retain the throne for himself and for his family. That's how it appears to me anyway. So he inquires, and uh, says about where did the star appear. He understood. They told him, we've seen his star in the east. And uh, they followed it. And there it was. And then he sends them to Bethlehem. And he says, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him again, bring me word again that I may come and worship him. Now you know and I know that he had no idea of worshipping him at all. These wise men had come from the east and they could generally say that they had made that journey in order that they should worship this one who was born king of the Jews. But here's Herod telling a barefaced lie really. He says, I want to come and worship him. So you tell me where the young child is. I don't know what you feel about that. But it seems to me that wicked men often act extremely foolishly. <laughs> you might say to yourself, why did, he, why did he rely on the wise men to tell him where they found the young child? If he didn't want to do it himself, he had plenty of men there in Jerusalem who could have followed the wise men to see where they went. But he didn't do that. And it's a lesson to us, isn't it? The enemies of God often act with folly. And it's because they are against God. I suppose we've seen it in our modern day politics. Well, we see it continually, don't we? But that's what he said. Go and search diligently, verse 8, for the young child. When you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him. And when they departed, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. You could almost say, why didn't they just follow the star anyway? Why did they make inquiry at Jerusalem? But they did. 
They could have just followed the star and it would have taken them to Bethlehem, to the very place where the Lord Jesus Christ was. But doesn't this teach us, doesn't this teach us that God is in control of all the events? God is a sovereign God overruling in everything that comes to pass. We call him a God of providence, don't we? And that's what he was doing then. That he should have said, that, the, that is he, King Herod, should have said to these men, you let me know, we might feel was a very foolish step on behalf, on the part of uh, the king. But God was in control of that. And it's a comfort to know that God is in control of things. And certainly as we think about the rise of the Antichrist, it's good to know that God is in control of everything that will come to pass. God not only knows what will happen, but in his wisdom and sovereignty, he has foreordained all that will come to pass. Well, the next verses just tell us about the wise men going to the house and finding the young child and Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. I, I can't help saying, I think it has to be said whenever you look at this passage, that it says nothing about worshipping the mother. They worshipped him. That is very specific. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was only a baby, it was him that they worshipped and they presented to him their gifts. Now Mary and, and Joseph were very, very poor but um, there was something which these wise men brought gold and frankincense of myrrh and they were warned of God, says verse 12 not to go back to Herod but to go back another way and that's what they did. And then God tells Joseph to take the young child and Mary his mother take them into Egypt. You might say Egypt is a funny place to go to when you think of Egypt's history, but that was what God had appointed and that's how it was to be. And Joseph agrees to do what the Lord tells him to and he takes Jesus and Mary by night, says verse 14, and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod. So that's the simple story thus far concerning the visit of the wise men to Jerusalem. But it's interesting to see the sequel, isn't it? Because in verse 16, Herod realised that he had been mocked. He realised that the wise men were not going to return to him. The wise men were not coming back to tell him where they found the king of the Jews. And what does he react? How does he react to all this? He's exceeding wrath, says verse 16. Exceeding wrath. There's no spirit of subjection to think to himself, well, I've been foolish. The Lord is overruled in this. If God puts a star in the heavens to indicate where the child is, there must be something special about this child in the purpose of God. He doesn't think like that at all. What does he think? He thinks to himself that he'll make sure that he gets this child somehow or the other. And so what does he do? Verse 16 tells us. He sends forth and he slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. Not just in Bethlehem itself. He wanted to make sure that the child wasn't excluded. He would make sure that he got this child dead. And so not only in Bethlehem, but in all the coast thereof. And here he was given quite a wide berth, it seems to me. Every child that was two years old or less, everyone had to be slain. What a ruthless fellow he was. You know, people love their babies, don't they? You imagine the mothers. All those mothers in Bethlehem in the, and in the coast thereof 
having their child slaughtered. Uh, some of us here are fathers, and we know what it's like to have children and love our children. And we're, when they're born, we look on our babies and we think how wonderfully they're made. What a wonderful creation a baby is, with all its parts. And in any case, people just love other people's babies, don't they? How many times have you seen people standing over prams and saying, oh, what a beautiful baby. It just happens, doesn't it? And I remember once a preacher saying about a baby that the baby was a sinner. And although there were a lot of people Christian there, they were quite offended because they thought it was such a lovely baby. <laughs> and the preacher had said the baby was a sinner. But of course, the preacher was right. But people do think a lot of babies. How, how ruthless and cruel Herod was in just slaughtering all of them. All of them. I don't know how many of the babies there would have been. Perhaps Bethlehem was not a, a large place. There's a carol that says a little town of Bethlehem. And of course Bethlehem would have been much smaller than Jerusalem. But even so, there would no doubt have been quite a few children who were two and under there. And uh, this is the way Herod treated them. He had them all slain. No wonder Matthew talks about the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah about the lamentation and the weeping. Great weeping going on for children. It was a very difficult thing. I was thinking that there is a scripture in Daniel chapter 11 which describes the Antichrist. And, and I felt in a way that it could be true of Herod. In Daniel chapter 11 and verse 21, it says, in his estate, shall, it's talking about the Antichrist, shall stand up a vile person. A vile person. Well, I think in a way, however vile the Antichrist may be, Herod is a picture the Antichrist is ruthless and Herod was ruthless. It wasn't just wicked, was it? It was more than wicked. He, he did this terrible act. And killed all these children. It's interesting to notice, isn't it, in the subsequent verses, the Herod was dead. Well, it says that in an earlier verse. Verse 15, unto the death of Herod. You know, however great Herod considered himself to be, however long he sought to hold on to the kingdom, he must fall in the end. We sing that hymn of Spurgeon's at the close of the service. In death, like men, they fall. And of course, that's a, really the thought comes from the psalm, doesn't it? Princes just fall. They all fall. All the great people of this world, they all come to their end. And that will be with Antichrist. You know, when Antichrist comes in and he'll think he's got such power and he will have great power, there's no doubt about it. He will have great power. But in the end, he'll fall. Going back to Daniel, if you look first at chapter 8, in chapter 8, those verses speak about the Antichrist. Verse 23, I suppose, onwards. But it says in verse 25, through his policy, that's the Antichrist policy, also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, he shall magnify himself in his heart, 
and by peace shall destroy many. But look at this last little sentence. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. God will intervene. And of course, when you go back to Isaiah chapter 10, you have the whole story of him marching down into towards Jerusalem. In the end of Isaiah chapter 10, we get his march. You know, he, he gathers all his troops together at Armageddon. Some people talk about the, Arma, the battle of Armageddon, but I can't find anything in the Bible about a battle at Armageddon. It's the gathering place for the troops. And that's, if you've been out to Israel, you'll know that that's a huge plain, Megiddo. And that's where the Antichrist will must draw all his troops, ultimately, to march down, to march down onto Jerusalem to put an end to the Jewish nation, as he thinks. He thinks he will destroy the nation. It will be a fulfilment of Psalm 83. Come and let us destroy them from being a people. They'll get rid of the Jews and that get an end to all this trouble that the Jews have caused all through the centuries. So they think that's what will happen. And when we come to Isaiah chapter 10, we have his march down um, towards Jerusalem. Verse 28, he has come to Ath, he has passed to Migran, at Michmash, he has laid up his carriages, they have gone over the passage, they have taken up the lodging at Geba, Rama is afraid, Gibeah of Saul is fled, lift up thy voice, O daughter of Galim, cause it to be heard unto Laish, O poor Anathoth, Michmash is removed, the inhabitants of Gebim gather themselves to flee, and yet he shall remain at Nob. They get as far as Nob, which is right almost into Jerusalem that day. He shall shake his head against the remnant of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord Jehovah of hosts shall lop the bow with terror. And the high ones of stature shall he hew down, and the haughty shall be humbled. And he shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. But I was also going to say while we were in Daniel, if you turn to chapter 11 of Daniel, again speaking of the Antichrist at the end of the chapter, talking there about going into the glorious mountain, but it says right at the end of the chapter, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. He shall come to his end. Well, in that way, Herod was a type of the Antichrist. Herod came to his end. He might have done all that he thought he could do to make sure that this babe, who seemed to have a special sign from heaven, that this babe would never become king, but he couldn't stop him. And it wasn't the babe that was slain. Many babies were. But it was Herod that came to his end. Let's turn over the pages now, shall we, and see another Herod in Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14, this was a Herod we're told, that had heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was interested to find out more about what he was hearing. He says to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. And therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. I don't know what made him think it was John the Baptist. But he obviously had a very troubled conscience about John the Baptist because the next verses tell, tell us what had happened. Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison. And he hadn't done it because he'd done anything wrong, but he did it for Herodias' sake. Herodias was originally Herod's brother Philip's wife. 
But Herod had taken the wife of his brother and made her his wife. That was something which was definitely wrong. And John had said so. Verse 4 tells us that. John had said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. You're not doing the right thing. John spoke plainly and rightly. He spoke according to the scriptures. He gave, he gave to Herod, this particular Herod, the message of God. So, what did Herod do? Well, he put him in prison. He was frightened to do anything else because of the multitude. He realised the people thought a lot of John, they counted him as a prophet, and he didn't do anything else. Whether he connived it, or who connived it all, or how it all happened, but it does talk about Herod's birthday coming, and um, this was marked as a special occasion. It's interesting to note, and I expect you've all noticed in the past, that there are two birthdays mentioned in the Bible, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. One was Pharaoh's birthday, one was Herod's birthday. And in Pharaoh's birthday, the baker lost his head, and at Herod's birthday, John the Baptist lost his head. But we'll come to that a little bit a bit later. It was the birthday, and the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. And so he promised to give her whatever she would ask. Rather well, a foolish thing to say, really, but that's what he did say. And she was instructed of her mother to say, give me John the Baptist's head in a charger. Not just to kill him, but give the head, and to me, that's what I would like to have, in a charger. It says there the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. Of course, he, he could have said, he could have said if he'd have really wished that that's something really that is wrong and I can't do. There's no reason for that. But he didn't. He sent, says verse 10, and beheaded John in the prison, and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. So John was slain. It sometimes seems, doesn't it, to some of us that that was a very strange thing. That John the Baptist, heralded by the prophets, not just Isaiah but Malachi too, John the Baptist should be so quickly taken from the earth. He had such an important work to do as the forerunner of the Messiah. And he was being mightily used in calling people to repentance. And yet, in God's providence, in God's purposes, John was slain a very short time after his ministry had commenced. <coughs> you think of all that happened at the birth of the, of the, of the Baptist and of the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb when Mary walked in, such a, such a man, and it says he was filled with the Spirit from the womb. Before he was born, he was filled with the Spirit. It's a marvellous thing. And yet, he comes to his ministry, and in the sovereignty of God, he's taken away in a very short time. But there we are. That's what we're told there. We have another record of the story in Matthew chapter 6. I don't know whether we could just have a look at that now. I think we've got time to do so. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works to show forth themselves in him. When Herod heard, says verse 16, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him 
and almost like um, some of the wicked queens in the Bible, isn't it? In the Old Testament, Jezebel and um, Athaliah. You know, Jezebel schemed against uh, Naboth and Athaliah, one well, of the wickedness that she performed. There we are. Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man. Herod understood that. He was a just man, a holy man. But when a convenient day was come, the Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod, and then that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he swear unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask, I will give it to thee, unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king, and asked, saying, I will, I will that thou give me by and by in a charge of the head of John the Baptist. It says, The king was exceeding sorry, yet for his own sake, and for the sakes of them which sat by him, with him, he would not reject her. And immediate, immediately, no delay on it, immediately the king sent an executioner and, and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him there in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. What a thing for a girl to want. And the damsel gave it to her mother. Herod knew he knew what kind of man John the Baptist was. <coughs> and yet instead of listening to his message, he was rebelling against God. And it's the spirit of rebellion, of course, in the world that will come to its climax, its fulfilment in Antichrist. I find it rather interesting that Herod thought that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. I don't know what Herod understood about this, but we know there is to be a resurrection, a final resurrection, of course, the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. We read about those resurrections in Scripture. But what did Herod understand about this? What did he know about resurrection? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know how he could have thought of the idea because the Lord Jesus Christ himself hadn't been raised at that time. Perhaps uh, Lazarus had been, I don't know. Perhaps he'd heard the stories of Jairus' daughter if that happened previously or not, I don't know. But Herod believed in the resurrection. Uh, and yet in spite of all this, in spite of all this, just think of this. He, would, he was thinking to himself that the man who he had killed, decapitated, that very man, he was thinking, had risen from the dead. And if he had risen from the dead, how did he rise from the dead? It must have been by the power of God. And yet in spite of all this, there's no repentance seen in Herod at all. You know, he's just like the other Herod. He cannot take, he cannot take what he might think to be a, a sign from God himself. And he will not receive it. There is no repentance at all. And it's interesting to see, isn't it? Because he says there in verse 1, verse 2, of chapter 14 of Matthew, he was... He thought he was risen from the dead. And he said, therefore, mighty works do show forth themselves in him. I find that intensely interesting. Why should he thought, why should he have thought that John the Baptist would have done mighty works? You know, if you turn to John chapter 6, is it John chapter 6? No, John chapter 10. John chapter 10 in verse 41, it tells us there that John did no miracle. He did no miracle at all. He didn't make water into wine. He didn't raise people from the dead. He didn't do any miracle. 
And yet, Herod hears about the Lord Jesus Christ and thinks that it's John the Baptist, and yet the man who he's thinking is John the Baptist is doing mighty works, which John the Baptist wasn't characterised by anyway. What it does say about John the Baptist, I always think is a marvellous thought there in chapter 10 of John. All things that John spake of this man were true. Oh, isn't that a lovely, isn't that a lovely testimony? If only that could be said of all of us, if only it could be said of me, I trust it is. I try to speak the truth, but whatever we say about the Lord Jesus Christ, it's true. We stick to the word of God, the Bible. That is the important thing, isn't it? And there we have it, that this Herod showed no signs of repentance whatsoever. And seems very pleased, really, to get rid of John. John had spoken against him, and it was a lovely thing to get John out of the way. People don't like faithful preachers, do they? They just don't like them. While preachers can, can preach softly spoken messages, nice little talks about God is love, they might get on very well. But when a preacher starts to preach what the Bible says, they're not liked. And John dealt with this situation very faithfully. He was a faithful testimony. What he spoke was true. And he laid down his life really because of it. It was in a way like these martyrs in, in um, our own country, wasn't it, in the time of the Reformation. They felt they must speak the truth. In the end, many of them were led to the stake because they did speak the truth. But thinking of Antichrist, you know, when you turn over to Revelation chapter 11, we read the story there of, um, of the two witnesses. It's talking about these 1260 days, verse 3 tells us that. So we know the period that it's talking about, so we're... We're talking about Antichrist's time, aren't we? They're prophesying. They're speaking the truth. They're witnesses to truth. They are God's witnesses. That's what it says, verse 3. My two witnesses. God will give them power to speak the truth. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit She'll make war against them. She'll overcome them and kill them. Just what Herod did to John the Baptist. Their dead bodies shall be in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Gomorrah. It bears the characteristics of Sodom and Gomorrah. But we're told here it's Jerusalem, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And listen to the verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. They're glad. <laughs> what a picture it was. Herodias and her daughter were so happy, seemingly, to get rid of John the Baptist. And so will it be in the days of Antichrist against those who are faithful to God. Now, can I just turn you over to Herod and the Apostles, to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Herod stretched forth his hand, says verse 1, to vex certain of the church. He just went against the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. There had been persecution. 
there had been persecution in Jerusalem. We don't read much about that in these next verses after they were scattered in chapter 8 and they were scattered abroad. But here's Herod going against God's people, God's true people, once again. Another Herod, I believe, um, you know, we are told about these Herods being different people, and uh, I think that's right. We're not going to all the question now, but here was another Herod, as I understand it. But um, he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. This was James. He started off with vexing the church, and then he, he does this act of killing James. Now, James was one of the three special disciples who was with the Lord very often when other disciples weren't, you know, up the Mount of Transfiguration and going into Jairus' home and so on. Peter, James and John were those who seemed specially favoured. And James, he was the brother of John. And he just slew him with the sword. Oh, I didn't say about the other Herod, did I? But it's true of this Herod. He doesn't, they don't bring them, he didn't, the other Herod didn't bring John the Baptist to court. He just, just slew him, just slew him. Without any justice at all. And this is exactly what this Herod is doing here. He just killed James with the sword. And then because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he thought he'd go further still. And what could be better than to take Peter? Peter had been the leading spokesman on the day of Pentecost. And uh, he wasn't the first pope, of course, as they make out. But he was the leading man. He had been the speaker. He'd been the speaker lots of times, I suppose. He used to speak up, but he certainly was the one whom God used. And, and of course, in these previous two chapters, we find about him being used to go to Cornelius and so on. And Peter had previously been put with John in prison. And, and they'd come out of prison. The Lord had taken them out of the prison. We read that in the earlier chapters. Acts chapter 5. I always think it's a marvellous chapter because they came out and went out preaching again about Jesus and when they were questioned and said, why, why are you doing this? We told you not to. Jesus said we ought to obey God rather than man. Acts 5 verse 29. A useful verse to always know. We ought to obey God rather than men. So Peter had come out of prison but now Herod, in his folly, which he thinks is wisdom, he puts Peter back in prison. But we find here that he's not going to he's not going to let Peter get out this time. He puts him right in a safe place. He has four quaternions of soldiers to keep him. And the idea was that after the Passover, after Easter as it's called there, or the Days of Unleavened Bread, as it's mentioned in verse 3. Uh, Easter may not be the best of translations, but it does tell us the time of year anyway. It was Passover time, of course. But uh, they had to bring him forth, and he thought that would be the end of Peter. That was his purpose, to make an end of Peter, once the holiday period was over. And so he, he put him there in the middle prison, he bound him with chains, that's what we read in verse 2. He had to be kept with soldiers, he was bound to them with the chains. And there were keepers at the door. There was no chance, as Herod saw it, of Peter escaping this time. It wouldn't happen. Herod was going to make sure about that. But you know what happened, and I know what happened. The angel 
It's marvellous to think of the angel of the Lord, isn't it? And we haven't got time to talk about it now, what the angel did, but the angel of the Lord came there into the prison, shined a light and told Peter to get up, put his sandals on and cast his garment about him and go out. What Peter could do, he had to do. Put his sandals on and put his garment on him. But what Peter couldn't do, the angel did. The angel put all the all the warders, all the soldiers to sleep and he opened all the doors. And they went right out first one, then the second one, and then they went to the main gate and that all opened and then Peter was out. He was out of prison. So that's a marvellous story, isn't it? But, of course, Herod didn't like it. Herod didn't like it. Herod was one who was opposing the church of God. But then the sequel to all this is rather interesting, isn't it? Verse 19 says, Herod sought for him and found him not and put the keepers to death. But this next little part, in chapter verse 20, Herod was upset with people at Tyre and Sidon up there on the northeast. But they didn't like being out of favour with Herod, apparently. So what they did, they made a friendship with the king's chamberlain, a man called Blastus, and they desired to be friends again with Herod together once again and why was it and that's interesting isn't it do you notice that what we've been hearing about this referendum and the, and the European Union it says there in the end of verse 20 why they wanted to be friendly with Herod why they wanted this union with him why they didn't want to fall out with Herod was because they were nourished by his country there was trade isn't that just what we've been hearing lately? We must have trade, we must have trade. <laughs> they obviously got things that wouldn't grow up in Tyre and Sidon, mountainous area, which they could get from Israel. And so they wanted to be friendly with, uh, with Herod. And so this was obviously accepted. Blastus um, brought the message of peace and the, the, Herod was pleased with all this. And he goes to see the people in Tyre and Sidon and, and glad to welcome them into the fold again. And it says in verse 21, on a set day, he was arrayed in special apparel, royal apparel. He sat upon his throne and he made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, all oh, these people in Tyre and Sidon. And what they said was, verse 22, it is the voice of a God. And not of a man. Well, that would have pleased Herod like anything, wouldn't it? Did please him, obviously. He never reproved them and said, "No, no, I'm just, no, I'm just a man. I am a king, but I'm a man. I'm not a god." He didn't say that at all, as far as we read here. When these people were were so pleased with what Herod had done with his great oratory. How marvellous an impression he had made upon them. So they acknowledged him to be God. God immediately stepped in in judgment. It immediately says verse 23. It's the angel of the Lord again. The angel of the Lord got people out of prison. Here's the angel of the Lord again. Smiting Herod. Why? because he gave not God the glory. And here's the sad thing, wasn't it? He was eaten up of worms and gave up the ghost. You know, perhaps we're all eaten by worms when we're buried, but here was Herod, eaten of worms, and then he gave up the ghost. And it just goes to show that God can bring upon men things just as he desires. God is in control of all men. Now, I was thinking of this in relation to the Antichrist. 
And it seems to me that as Herod opposed the church and killed James and sought to do the same with Peter, it's a reminder of what the Antichrist will be like. You know, in Revelation chapter 13, we read a lot about the Antichrist, doesn't, don't we? It says there in verse 15 about power that was given to the false prophet who supported the Antichrist to give unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Those people who will not submit to the Antichrist, the purpose of the Antichrist will be that they should be killed. No wonder the Lord Jesus Christ spoke a time, about a time of great tribulation, far worse than any other, anything that's been in the past. We can't imagine things worse, can we, than the Spanish Inquisition and some of the ways men have been treated, even in the Roman days. Cruel things that were done to those early believers and cruel things that have been done through the centuries to believers. But the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about it as something at the end of the age, which will be greater and worse than all of that. And that's, that's the type that Herod is, I think, as he was seeking to kill people in the church, leading people like James and Peter, so the Antichrist will seek to oppose and seek to kill those that will not worship him. And of course, true believers cannot worship the Antichrist. They will not worship the Antichrist. There may be many professors who will, we believe that there will be many professing Christians who will, but they're only professors and not possessors of the grace of God. But true Christians cannot do so. They'll have to say, you have to convince me like Luther did. You convince me by God's word. Here I stand. I can do no other. And then, of course, when we see Herod here um, making this great oration and people calling him God, we know it will be the desire of the Antichrist to be like God. Well, we read that in several places, don't we? But perhaps I could just turn you for, for time's sake just to 2 Thessalonians, a well-known passage, of course. 2 Thessalonians 2. It says there in verse 4 about this man of sin, the son of perdition, that is the Antichrist who will arise before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says here, he opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is to be worshipped. It'll be worse than any Herod. He'll, he'll seek to get all the power to himself. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, I understand that to be the temple which will be in Jerusalem, showing himself that he is God. We can quite see the way of this world, can't we? Where ecumenicity is leading to and how every religion is losing its distinctive and that's what will happen. In a way, it's like Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar could see all this in his wisdom that religion was a, um, a curse it was, it was uh, something that caused wars, something that caused trouble. Do you do open air work? I feel as if I'm always being told when I'm in the open air that religion, all the trouble in the world comes through religion. And, and it does in a way. That's through false religion, of course. But religions are a menace to politicians. And if only they could unite religions, it would be wonderful. And of course, that's what Nebuchadnezzar sought to do. I have no other gods except this idol that he set up on the plain of Dura, this great golden image that he made. Therefore, he could unite all the, all the people in the whole of his empire into one religion to worship this golden image. It was a marvellous thought politically. But of course, there were still some who feared God and sought to do what was right. And Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, as, we, as they're often called, they refused to worship the golden image. And of course, that's how it will be at the end of this age. 
We read there in Thessalonians about him setting himself to be God. I believe the temple will be built in Jerusalem. The Antichrist will place the abomination of desolation in the temple. And that will cause a lot of problems with the Jews, of course. But uh, ultimately, he'll want all to worship him, setting himself up as God. That is the simplest answer to all the political problems if they just have one religion and worship the Antichrist. If they'll all say, he is God. Well, that's how Herod was pleased to have it, as we've read in, uh, in Acts chapter 12. But it's noticeable too, we've already said this perhaps about a previous Herod, but it's noticeable too, isn't it? The judgment of God fell upon Herod. Verse 23, immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And that's what will happen from the Antichrist. Well, we've already seen that in some texts in the Old Testament, haven't we? But if you turn to Revelation 19, we are reminded of the Antichrist's end. Can I call it his end? Because it's not his end, really, but but uh, the end of his reign and the end of all his, all his making himself to be something. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20, it says the beast, that's the Antichrist, was taken, and also the false prophet, and they were both, both cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. God's judgment will fall on the Antichrist. God's judgment certainly fell on this particular Herod, but it will fall on the Antichrist. But can I mention one other thing? I feel I must do this. I think it's lovely, don't you? And it's a lovely end. We will end here. In Acts 12, we haven't read it yet, but when you go past the time when Herod was smitten by the angel of the Lord, it says there in verse 24, the word of God grew and multiplied. And certainly it's a truth, isn't it, that when the Lord comes and deals with the Antichrist, with the brightness of his coming, when he deals with sin and, and brings judgment upon all the ungodly, as um, Jude tells us, Enoch spoke about, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his saints uh, to bring judgment on all the ungodly, the word of God will grow. Because you turn to a passage like Isaiah 2 or Micah 4, and it talks about that time in Judah and Jerusalem when the Lord Jesus Christ has come again and dealt with sin and sinners. It shall come to pass that the mountain of Jehovah's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. All nations shall flow unto it there in Jerusalem. And many people shall go and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Jehovah to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. Now look at this. The word of God grew, it says, when Herod died. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Jehovah from Jerusalem. The word of God grew, we read in Acts. But that's, in a way, just a very poor type. It'll be a wonderful day. When the Lord comes and the word of Jehovah will go out from Jerusalem. And it will, it will go out and the Jews will be the best missionaries the world has ever had to take the message of the, of the gospel to, to people all over the globe. What a wonderful day that will be. And, and I'll tell you what, there won't be any argument about versions in those days. I hold strongly to the authorised version of scripture, as you know. But there will be no arguments about versions in those days. It will be the pure word of God that goes out from Jerusalem. The pure word of God. So I feel we can close on a happy note.